Welcome, modern day mystics, fellow true seekers, James and Justin, back again with another reaction. Now, this one has been a high demand request. This is The Purpose of Life by Jeffrey Lang. Now, this has uh, some ties to Islam. It's, uh, I think, about his kind of journey into Islam. Uh, and yeah, uh, you guys have been asking for this one, so we're gonna give it to you. Now, we're gonna separate it into two parts, and we're gonna try to do as little talking, because this is really long, as possible. We'll probably stop it in the middle and then talk at the end. Um, so we can just let the video play out, watch and learn. So with all that said, let's begin. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, <clears throat> my, uh, I've come from the University of Kansas. We're playing in the Final Four this very instant. <laughs> so I want to let you know that you've asked a lot of me today. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. <clears throat> All right, I want, very briefly, I, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, what the Quran has to say about the purpose of life. Uh, I think this is an extremely important subject, especially for Muslims living in America, because we're uh, sort of a minority, a new religion here, and many people are interested in what we believe, and I think the primary question that people want answered when they first consider another religion is how that religion views, it's how that religion views the purpose of life, the purpose of human, uh, of our existence here. And so, um, <clears throat> I'm going to begin, though, uh, uh, talking about the athe an atheist point of view. Because I want to talk about what sort of que answers the Quran might have for an atheist. So to begin this, I need to talk for about five or ten minutes about you know, what, made me, what I believe contributed to my becoming an atheist, because I grew up in a Christian family. And then I'll talk for about oh, 45 minutes or so about uh, what I experienced in the Quran and how that sort of changed my perception. So it's very simple. But my wife always says I should summarize what I'm going to do before I talk because it's easy to get lost in my speeches. And <clears throat> you know, my wife doesn't have a lot of confidence in my speaking ability. <laughs> okay, so uh, let me start out by uh, mentioning that my mother certainly played no role in my becoming an atheist. My mother was a a wonderful woman, uh, a beautiful lady. She had tremendous dignity and class. She, uh, uh, the neighbors loved her. She was a, a registered nurse, and she put in many extra hours at the hospital. Her, she worked in the ward that dealt with dying patients. And when I would come and pick her up late from work at night, all the patients would, not all the patients, but many of the patients would drag me over and talk to me and tell me what a wonderful woman my mother was. When she died, her funeral was packed and person after person that came up to me had a story to tell about my mother and her goodness. Time and time again, people described her as, Jeff, you know, your mother is a true saint. She was a deeply religious woman, a great mother, a great teacher, a gentle person. She never cursed. I never heard her curse, you know, swore ever in her whole life. Never heard her speak to anybody rudely or speak about anyone rudely. She was a tremendous example of a, of a truly religious person. And she didn't wear it on her sleeve. It was just slowly but surely you could see it just in her day-to-day -day interactions with people. Uh, my father, on the other hand, was a difficult man. Um, my father, <clears throat> for some strange reason, had this tremendous rage inside him. I don't know where he got it. Uh, he had this terrible violence inside him. And every night, he would try to quell that violence with hard, hard drinking. And his drinking, though, only made him all the more volatile. Because my father could be laughing and joking one minute, and he could fly into an angry rampage the next for some unexpected reason. You never know what would trigger it. And once he flew into that angry rampage, 
It would take, you know, he would just go wild in the house. The house would be in havoc. And he would rage on and on and on, and it would take an awful lot of liquor and several hours before he would finally go to sleep. And this would happen night after night after night. And so my four brothers and I, I was the fourth in line, my four brothers and I lived a frightening and precarious childhood. But I'd have to say the worst of it was watching my father regularly taunt and threaten and abuse my mother. And it would happen day in, day in, day in, day out, night in, night out. And it was a never, never ending nightmare. You see, it's really not so bad when you're the target of your father's violence. You might think it's bad when a child is the target of their father's violence, but it's really not all that bad. Uh, at the moment of attack, you're really not thinking about anything except your own survival. When he's firing punches at you or kicking you on the ground or chasing th you throughout the house, or when he's threatening you, I'm going to hurt you, bad boy, you're not thinking about anything at that moment except escape. While all that's going on, you're not thinking about the aftermath or consequences, the psychological repercussions or anything like that. And when it's all over, you might even excuse the onslaught because you figure maybe you somehow deserved it. If not for what you did this time, maybe for something you did in the past. You could always put the blame on yourself. But a far worse fear is the terror that overcomes you when you watch your father go after your mother because she's the only source of warmth and kindness, of love and protection that you know. And if he were to take that away, from a little boy's standpoint, then you've lost everything. But far worse than the fear is the guilt. And it comes over you from several directions. First of all, there's the guilt that comes at you for, for, uh, upon you from the growing antipathy you have towards your father because we're taught to love and respect our parents, and we are born with this natural bonding attachment to them. But when you watch something like this happen night after night after night, and you, this rage is growing inside you, you're being pulled in opposite directions. Then there's also, of course, the guilt that comes when you think that you might be the cause of this nice, night's violence. Maybe something you said or did that you didn't even realize triggered it. Maybe just your father's dislike of you triggered an argument between your mom and him that is now raging on downstairs. But the worst guilt of all, and it is by far the very worst, is knowing that you did nothing to stop your father from hurting your mother. Because while he raged on against your mother downstairs, you hid in your bed and you trembled underneath the covers Maybe you whimpered and you cried and you put the pillow on your head. And thus, you traded personal respect for personal safety. And with each such incident, you come to realize with ever greater and greater clarity, you come to realize your own weakness, your own impotence, your own incompetence, your own worthlessness, your own cowardice. And the hate grows and festers inside you, not only for the man that you call father, but for yourself as well. It is a terrible, terrible thing to make a young boy choose between his mother and himself. It is extremely unfair. I noticed that tomorrow there's going to be a, a lecture about, tomorrow morning, a lecture about spousal abuse uh, given by Dr. Uh, Shaheen. Um, Rizwan. I hope you'll all attend it. I think it's a very important subject. When I was little, I used to daydream about life without my father. I just wanted the violence to go away. I wanted not to be afraid anymore. I felt like I was trapped in a bad dream and there was no way out. And so I prayed to God again and again and again to take, to remove my father from our lives. But he was always there, and very soon I began to wonder if God really was. I could not fathom why God would subject my mom to such lifelong punishment. I could not imagine what great sin she must have committed, or that we, 
her children must have committed to deserve my father. I didn't have the maturity to sort out such questions, but I had enough fear and anger to provoke them. I was too young to see the wisdom in allowing my father to, I mean my mom, to suffer the violence and abuse of my father. I was too young to understand why God would let innocent children tremble night after night after night in their beds, fearing that they might not see their mother the next morning. I was too young to see how the mercy of God could even extend to my father with all his terrible failings. All I could see in my world was chaos and violence and fear, and so it became easy for me to question the existence of God, and I began to do that at a very early age. I think I'll even say that the turmoil of the 60s and 70s, that's the age when I was a teenager, in the, you know, late 60s, early 70s, only uh, reinforced my skepticism. When John and Robert F. Kennedy were assassinated, or Martin Luther King was gunned down, when Vice President Agnew was kicked out of office and Richard Nixon soon after him, when the race riots erupted in city streets like mine, and gang fights erupted in our cities, many of those which I was involved in, when I saw the bizarre and senseless carnage of Vietnam, they all confirmed the lesson that was already ingrained in me and that my father had taught me so well, that the world is dominated by random, consuming, undiscriminating violence. And very soon I began to ask why. Why would God make it that way? Why wouldn't he just pop us into heaven from the first and spare us all this suffering? Why does he let little children in Vietnam get napalmed and run down the street naked on fire? when they had done nothing to deserve it? You know, why does he let the race riots go on? Why does he let the leaders be assassinated? Why does he just let the violence go on and on and on for people who had nothing to do with it? It wasn't of their own making. Why didn't he just make us angels and pop us into heaven if he could make us angels, which I was always taught he could? <clears throat> why did he make us so susceptible to sin? Why didn't he make us impervious to it? like he made the angels. <laughs> is this the best world he could create, I thought? Is this the most perfect world he could create for our existence, for our beginning? I just couldn't figure it. And all the explanations I received from priests and doctors and lawyers, you know, from whoever you know, spoke to me or taught me, they just didn't make sense to me. In any case, so I became an atheist when I was 16, even though I was going to Catholic school at the time declared myself an atheist in one class. It was a confrontation between me and a priest. We were talking about God and the purpose of life. And I expressed my views, and he said, well, then you don't believe in God. I said, well, I guess I don't. And then through my junior, uh, junior and senior year of high school, I got an F in religion, even though I continued to do very well in the tests. <clears throat> in any case, when I was 28, to make a long story short, some friends of mine gave me a copy of the Quran. <clears throat> And one night I was sitting in Diamond Heights, my apartment in Diamond Heights in San Francisco. I was working that time at the University of San Francisco. I was 27, 28 at that time, I can't remember. And I ran out of stuff to read, and I took this gift that my friends gave me and I began to read it. And I came to the first verse, well, I opened the Quran, read the first page, then the second, and then very quickly, in the second surah, about 37 verses into the Quran, I came upon the story of mankind. And uh, I have to admit, I read through it very quickly. It was about nine, ten verses long, the story of the first man and woman. And I recognized some of the details. It was similar to what I had learned when I was a child. But I noticed that there was something wrong. It was apparent to me that whoever authored this Quran, of course, I wasn't a Muslim at the time, so I didn't have any idea who that was. Whoever authored this Quran clearly did not understand the real meaning of the story because they had obviously gotten the details confused. They even didn't even understand the whole purpose of the story. <clears throat> and so uh, I just read through it once, and then I read through it again, just to try to see what kind of point the author was making. And then I read through it a third time and a fourth, and then I realized this is something strange going on here. I'm going to read this much more carefully. I'm going to need to go through this story line by line, verse by verse, because it's obvious that the author is trying to bring out another point and I wasn't quite sure what it was, but definitely he packs a lot of meaning into almost every word. And I thought the writer at least seems to have a great measure of brilliance. 
And so I'll try to sort of take you through what my experience was as quickly as I can. So I came to the second, the 30th verse of the second surah, Surah Al-Baqarah, and it began like this. It said, Behold, your Lord said to the angels, I am going to place a vicegerent on earth. The Arabic word is khalifa. It means a representative or an emissary of mine. I am going to place a vicegerent on earth. And they said, the angels said, Will you place therein one who will spread corruption and shed blood while we celebrate your praises and glorify your holiness? And God said, he said, truly I know what you do not know. See, that's the verse that hooked me. That's the verse that caught my attention. That's the one that kept on making me read the story again and again and again. Because listen to the way it begins. Behold, your Lord said to the angels, I'm going to place a representative of mine on earth, a vicegerent of mine, an emissary, one who acts on my behalf. I thought, that, that's not the way it goes. <laughs> You're not supposed to be placing man on the earth in some positive role, some elective office. You place man as a, on earth as a punishment for his sin. Clearly, I knew the author didn't quite get the point. But still, it was <laughs> an amazing line. But then I come to the next line, and it says, and the angels say, Will you place her in one who will spread corruption and shed blood while we celebrate your praises and glorify you? I looked at it again. I couldn't believe the question. They said, will you place her in one who will spread corruption and shed blood while we, the angels, celebrate your praises and glorify you? I looked at that and I said, exactly. That would be my question. Why would you create this being supposedly for some positive role, when he's capable of doing tremendous wrongdoing, when he could spread corruption and shed much blood. Why would you create this violent and pernicious creature when you could create angels, as the angels clearly say? Well, we, well, we the angels, celebrate your praises and glorify you. They were asking one of the most fundamental questions in the entire history of religion. Why create you, man, this utterly fallible creature, this creature who could rebel against God's will, who could do such tremendous wrongdoing, who could wreak havoc like no other creature on earth, when you can make them angels? And look where the question is being asked. It's being asked in heaven. It's almost like saying, look, why don't you just make them angels and be up here in heaven with us, you know? <laughs> Yeah. Why don't you just make him angels, pop them into heaven, he's fine. Why would you put him on earth where he could feel distant from you, where he could work out his worst criminal tendencies, act them out, feeling somehow independent and apart from you and free to do whatever he wants, when you could just make him angels and put him into heaven and make him perfectly submissive to your will? I looked at that question and said, that's my question. I'm not, I'm one, not even a single verse into the story of mankind, and there before me I see my question. That whole question, everything that I ever thought, everything that I ever experienced, everything that I ever knew was in that question. It was as if the author took my life and wanted to pick out exactly the right question to humiliate me, to provoke me, to anger me. Why create man, this most destructive and violent creature, when you can make him angels? And then look at the answer. And he said, God said, truly I know what you do not know. You know, in modern parlance, we would say, I know exactly what I'm doing. I read that and said, what? You know what you do not know? You know exactly what you're doing? Well, please inform me. Tell me what you're doing. Because, you know, I'm, I'm 28 years old, and I haven't figured out it yet. And I have a lot of issues that I'm still dealing with that's connected to this question. You can't just get off that easy. You can't just tell me you know exactly what you're doing. Not after what I've been through. Not after you made me this way. And then I realized, of course, I was arguing with a God I didn't even believe in. And that would happen several times as I read through the Quran. And sometimes I would just get into such... such so agitated by what I read, I'd start arguing with this voice that's... That's, that I'm reading before me, that's calling to me. So we turn to the next verse. Well, it turns out that the Quran just doesn't dismiss the question. It starts to answer it a little bit. 
And in the next verse it says, And he taught Adam, God taught Adam, the names of all things. And then he placed them before the angels and said, Tell me their names if you are right. So this verse is clearly referring to the previous one. But notice what it says. Now, I, I, from my own background, I remember Adam naming things. But it wasn't connected to any answer to any philosophical question. But here, notice what it says. And he taught Adam the names of all things. And I realized already, just from the first verse, you've got to read these verses very carefully because it's packed with a lot of symbolism and meaning. And he taught Adam the names of all things. So here we see Adam is not only just a creature who knows how to name things, who's acquiring the gift of language, but he's also a learning creature. God is teaching him. Now right here, right in this verse, and it'll come even clearer in the subsequent verses, that the very first thing that the, that the Quran is going to emphasize here is man's intellect. He is a learning creature. He is taught. And what is he taught? What is, the, what is one of the great intellectual gifts he's given in response to the angel's question? The gift of language. Because through language, mankind could not only learn, but he could learn things not only through his own experience, but he could learn things that other people have experienced of times and places that are hundreds, thousands of years and miles separated from him. And so that all our knowledge becomes cumulative. Every generation learning from the generation before it. I'm learning today from authors I read from other sides of the world that may have existed 2,000 years ago. And so we all contribute to our collective learning and knowledge. And so we'll I'll see later in the Quran, when the Quran will emphasize this again and again and again, like in one verse it says, read in the name of your Lord who created. Created a man out of a tiny creature that clings. Read, it commands the reader, for your Lord is most bountiful. Why is he most bountiful? What great gift did he give you? For he taught man the use of the pen, and through it taught him what he otherwise could not know. And time and time and time again, the Quran will call upon man to use his intellectual faculties and swear by his intellectual faculties and to, and to use them correctly as a, as, as, because they play a fundamental role in guiding him to truth. I never came upon a scripture that puts so much emphasis on the correct use of our intellectual faculties, on the harnessing of reason in helping us attain to faith. And he taught Adam the names of all things. And then he placed them before the angels and said, tell me their names if you are right. Okay, you have this objection to, you have this natural question about this creation of mankind. Here, this mankind is a, this is a human being, this human creature is a learning creature. He has many intellectual gifts. Here, I'm gonna place these things before you. Tell me their names if you are right about man. And what did the angels say? In the next verse they say, Glory to you. We have no knowledge except what you have taught us. In truth, it is you who are knowing the wise. They say this, would be, this task, this intellectual test that's put before them is beyond their grasp. Notice what they emphasize. We have no knowledge. This would take knowledge. This would take an intellect that they don't possess. In truth, it is you who are knowing the wise. You got it. It's easy for you. You have you're the knowing, the wise. You have knowledge. You have wisdom. But this would take knowledge and wisdom that is beyond us. And so in the next verse we read, and he said, Oh, Adam, tell them, tell them their names. And when he had told them their names, notice how it's just like it's nothing for him. For mankind, he has this phenomenal ability. And when he had told them their names, as if it's just a triviality for man, he names them. Oh, Adam, tell them their names. And when he had told them their names, God said, did I not tell you that I know what is unseen in the heavens and the earth? And I know what you reveal and conceal? And he's clearly going back to the angel's question. Yes, you have these natural concerns about the creation of mankind. Yes, he could do these evil things. But look at this tremendous intellect he has. This is something you have overlooked that you haven't considered. And that's clearly the point of these verses. Even though I, under, I felt that the author didn't quite, uh, you know, he, it was as if I, I realized that he didn't, not, just didn't misunderstand the story. 
He was taking one of the great stories in the history of humankind, one of the fundamental greatest stories in the history of mankind, and molding it and using it as a vehicle for an entirely original message. <clears throat> and God said, did I not tell you that I know what is unseen in the heavens and the earth? And I know what you reveal and what you conceal? In other words, didn't I tell you I know exactly what I'm doing? And then in the next, and didn't I not tell you what I, that I know what you reveal and conceal? I looked at that. What question did... I just want to clarify in case there was any confusion. That one part when I... Sometimes I laugh when I can empathize deeply. You know, when he's questioning, well, that's my oh, question. Yeah, 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 and, yeah. and I kind of was like, yeah. I wasn't trying to be uh, disrespectful. <laughs> yeah. I don't even know. Other than that, I don't know what to say. There's, there's so much said there. What could I add to this? Yeah. So far we're hearing, you know, I, I think what is a pretty common story for a spiritual seeker or someone asking like evolutionary questions, in my opinion. I'm shocked when there are people out there like, I've never, like how many people would say like, I, I've never asked, you know, why would God create, you know, terrible things? Why, like, and that's kind of what we're seeing in the first quarter is kind of like the journey of like wrestling through some of these obvious questions. But I think all of us have to do it. We do it individually when we're children. Starts off as kids when we start questioning things like, how can there be so much nonsense going on if God is in control of this? And why wasn't it just created perfect in the first place? Yeah, especially since he even gives an example, right? Yeah. yeah especially since he says, "You can. we know you can make angels. Why... Why wouldn't you just make it a angels? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a bit. That's an important aspect of it. Yeah. So I, I suspect that we are going to get the Islam, Islam explanation in here for for some of those. He's questions. already explaining it. Yeah. He's already starting to break it down. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's an important thing. You know, like it's hard because. I think sometimes the, th there's in, the only impediment to grasping what anybody's saying is your own memory and your own tr trouble and traumas. Yeah, yeah. But it's an important point when he talks about, like, look at your intellect. Have you considered your intellect? Yeah, and, yeah. And, you know, somebody said to me recently something that was pretty brilliant. It was like, what, do you want to do away with processes? Yeah. And I say all that trying to be as absolutely humble as possible, that suffering is its own... Who can talk about suffering? Who the heck can talk about the decisions you make that grew out of your suffering? Like the, this, all, that set of decisions I make yeah, yeah. were based on the suffering I was in. Who other than the sufferer can talk about that? I, I wait to hear what he says. Well, yeah. You know? Um, Heartbreaking beginning part. Yeah, yeah. No, obviously. So yeah, really you could, tough. That, and maybe it's a little presumptuous, but I'm like, he's got a tenderness to him that, I don't know, maybe you only get that kind of tenderness from some of the hell that he'd been through. You know, you can yeah, hear yeah. it in his voice that this guy identified so clearly what was wrong with that. One person might be abused by their father that way and grow up and be like, that's how things are. I can't wait to abuse some people. Yeah, yeah. yeah like like awful. as if that doesn't happen. But yeah. this guy allowed it to... To this day, carry it in his voice. It's like, is he going to cry any minute? And there's something sort of sweet and tender about that. No. I don't know how else to put it. Yeah. All right. Well, that's halfway through our first part. Let's continue uh, to the next. They're, I mean, what did they reveal and what did they conceal? What did their question reveal and conceal? I thought about it for a minute. Oh, it's obvious. What did their question reveal? Just go back and look at the question. It revealed the sinful and sinister propensities of man. I mean, it's obvious, right? Why are you all looking at me like that? <laughs> You're starting to scare me. You're all looking very serious. Am I losing you? <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. So, they revealed the sinister and evil propensities of man. But what did their question conceal? And all you have to do is think about it for a minute. Human beings, yes, they could do evil. Yes, they could do wrong. Yes, they could create misery. But they could also do exactly the opposite. They could choose to do evil. They could choose to do tremendous good. They could choose to do tremendous violence. They could choose to show tremendous compassion. 
They could choose to be, to, you know, to live by falsehood. They could choose to live by the, the greatest truths. They could be terribly ugly. They could be terribly beautiful. And I, up until that point in my life, I, like the angels, had only saw one half of one side of the coin. And for the first time when I read that verse, believe it or not, it was an eye opener for me. I had always been <laughs> obsessed with the evil potentials of human beings. When I read that verse, I realized that, and I had a great example right in front of me with my own mom, I realized that I had been blinded by only one side of human nature. So we go on to the next verse. And behold, we said to the angels, bow down to Adam, and they bowed down. But not so Iblis. Iblis is like the father of Satan. <laughs> Satans, satanic beings, forces, creatures, existences. He refused and was arrogant. He was of those who reject faith. An interesting statement. And behold, we said to the angels, bow down to Adam. And they bowed down. Bowing down could symbolize two things. Bowing down could symbolize the superiority or potential superiority of one being over another. And so they bowed down to them. Bowing down could also mean that they serve that creature in some respect. Of course, the Quran says that all beings serve God, all created beings serve God. But this verse seems to be indicating, and the rest of the Quran will make it clear, that these angelic beings, these angelic uh, uh, entities, will serve the development of mankind. We'll even see later that the satanic beings serve the development of mankind. Both forces, angelic and satanic, will serve the development of mankind. Because one will present man with a choice to do the most altruistic things. The other will simultaneously try to influence man in the opposite direction. And so human, human beings will be moral creatures and will have to make moral decisions. And it's in those moral decisions that they will grow spiritually and morally as human beings. And they'll take that into the next life. And the angelic and the satanic forces will be catalysts for those moral choices that they make. They will heighten the human being's awareness of the rightfulness and the wrongfulness of the choice he's about to make. And the self, the soul, the nefs, as they say in Arabic, will have to make the ultimate choice between good and evil. And that choice, that test will come again and again and again as human beings either grow or decline. And those tests will come again and again and again to try to help him towards his spiritual evolution to bring him back, but that choice is ultimately ours. <clears throat> but I'm getting ahead of myself. And so we've said to the angels, bow down to Adam, and they bow down. But not so Iblis. Iblis is Satan, this rebellious force, this evil prompter, the one who whispers into the human heart. He comes into being. <clears throat> and with the introduction of Satan, we have the introduction of evil, that evil influences on human beings. And notice why Iblis does not bow down. He refuses because he was arrogant. You know, we often hear the, what's the root of all evil? In the West, it's always money, greed, etc. Here the Quran says that, seems to be saying that the root of all evil is not always material wants. It's not always money. It's not always greed. At the heart of evil is arrogance. Putting yourself above all others. Of assigning to yourself special priority and neglecting the rights of others, of, of, uh, of pride and arrogance and envy, the source of evil. He was of those who reject faith. I looked at that verse and I said, okay. I mean, I get why you would create angels to sort of influence man in a positive direction. But why in this story now are you introducing Satan? What sort of role does was Satan play? And then, of course, you just think about it for a minute and you say, yes. The story is telling us that on one hand, we have these magnanimous urgings come from one direction. On the other hand, we have these satanic urgings coming from another direction. In other words, the Quran is telling us that man is not only a learning creature, but he's a moral creature. He has understanding of right and wrong. And God infuses those, allows those influences to come to him. Man is not only an intelligent being, but a moral being. 
And so, you know, the Quran is not all that difficult to understand. You just sort of read it, I found, and you just sort of follow your nose through it and see what it's saying. <clears throat> I'm sure as most of you in this audience know. <clears throat> okay, so we see that man is not only a learning creature, but he is a, a moral being as well. There's another verse in the Quran that says, by the soul and that which whispers into it, or it which breathes into it. It's morality, it's immorality, and it's God consciousness. Both of these we are, we are under the influence of. And God allows us to be under the influence of this. He creates us to, to be exposed to both influences. And then the verse says, truly he is successful who causes it to grow. Causes his soul, his self, his real self to grow. And truly he is lost who stunts it who disallows, who, who destroys his personal growth. So mankind is not only an intellectual being, but a moral being. And we said in the next verse, O oh Adam, dwell you and your spouse in the garden, and eat freely thereof what you wish, and eat freely thereof what you wish. But come not near uh, this tree, for then you will be among the wrongdoers. I looked at this verse, and I was you know, starting to wonder if the author was drifting back to the old story again. I was confused. And we said, O oh Adam, dwell you and your spouse in a garden, and eat freely thereof what you wish, but come not near this tree, for you will be among the wrongdoers. I thought it was drifting back to the old story. Man sins, man's punished for his sins with earthly life. Maybe the author is drifting, he had a good idea, and now he's drifting back to the sort of traditional story. Maybe he couldn't man make his mind up what story he wanted. Except for a couple things about this verse, and this happened with almost every verse as I read through it, is that uh, the whole tenor of the passage is sort of uh, not what you would expect. I noticed that the Quran in this story has a tremendous penchant for understating things. Because it says, uh, and said to Adam, dwell you and your spouse in the garden, and eat freely thereof what you wish to Adam and his spouse. But come not near this tree, for you will be among the wrongdoers. I mean, there's no sense of God being threatened by the possibility of man eating from the tree. In this story, we don't see that, you know, in this verse, we don't see that God is nervous at the prospect, that he's threatened by the prospect, that he's anxious about it. The tree that he picks, he picks it seems like he's just picking out any tree. Nothing special about the tree. Go not near uh, this tree, for you will be among the wrongdoers. Satan will later come to him and tell him it's a tree of eternal life, of a kingdom that never decays. Turns out to be a complete faucet in his part. Nothing special about the tree. It's just a tree. God's not nervous at the prospect at all. You know, in the tradition that I came from, God is threatened by the prospect. He has to put an angel with a fiery sword, a sword by to protect the tree. So that mankind never goes next to it again. I'm not putting it down. I'm just pointing out the difference of the story. They're both beautifully told. But they say, you know, who has to guard the tree? Why? Because if they eat from it, they'll become gods like us. So this man, he saw already he has a rebellious nature. Can you imagine if he eats from the, this tree? No. Can't let him get near that tree. <clears throat> but here, just, you know, calmly says, you know, but if you do, you'll be among the wrongdoers. God is not worried about himself. It's just warning man, making it clear that if you do this, you've committed a wrongful deed. <clears throat> Again, the, the whole tenor of the path, all these verses that you read through it is God knows exactly what he's doing. Okay, next verse. But Satan caused them to slip and expelled them from the state in which they were. And we said... Go you all down, some of you being the enemies of others, and on earth will be your dwelling place and provision for a time. What, I said? <laughs> I mean, you know, I was expecting now the rage, the anger, the violence, the jealousy. That's what I was expecting. Okay, they eat from the tree. Where's the rage, the violence? I'm going to punish you now. You're going to sweat on earth. And you're going to suffer, and you're going to stub your toe, and you're going to work, and you're going to labor. And you're going to die there for what you did. And where is the woman? All right? <laughs> and the woman. All right? She's the one who's going to suffer the most. Right? 
She'll have to suffer labor pains and monthly cycles right? and bleeding and crying out when her children come into the world. And she'll scream out. And worst of all, the greatest humiliation, the man will rule over her. When he's obviously her intellectual inferior because she and the angels seduced, she and, she, she and Satan seduced him and he just bumbled along and then committed a real, you know, wrong deed. <laughs> well, I don't mean to make light of it. But the story is obviously different though. You know, no, no threat here. As a matter of fact, look at the way it says, O oh, Adam, dwell you and your spouse in the garden and eat freely thereof what you wish. But come not near this tree, for you will be the among the wrongdoers. Then they make the mistake. But Satan caused them to slip and expelled them from the state in which they were. And we said, go all you down. Some of you being enemies of others will be adversaries of others. Some of you will be adversaries of each other. And on earth will be your dwelling place and provision for a time. This is not a deity losing it. If you look at it, I mean, on earth will be your dwelling place and provision for a time. That's not the words of a, of a god that has got lost you know, that is really extremely upset. On earth will be your dwelling place and provision for a time. When I walked into the hotel today, and they said, uh, and it's this nice one up here, I don't know the name, I can't remember the name of it, but that's a continental breakfast. <laughs> and they said, uh, your room will be room uh, 111, and uh, there's a continent, continental breakfast in the morning. I didn't say, <gasps> you know, I didn't think they were mad at me. You know, because he said, you know, you're going to sleep here and this is going to be your provision in the morning. Uh -huh. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you <know? clears throat> but notice something else about this verse. I mean, when you read these verses for the first time, I don't know, maybe I'm nuts. <laughs> and many people think I am. But when you read these verses for the first time, I mean, this is just so much that catches your attention. But Satan caused them to slip. I remember, I, I couldn't get that verse out of, that, those words out of my head. Satan caused them to slip to slip? The greatest sin in the history of the human race, and it's called a slip? You know, in my culture, slip means, you know, you just momentarily, for a fraction of a second, you lose your focus. It's not a big deal. My Uncle Bob used to always say to me, uh, Jeff, I'm sorry, I'm five minutes late, I slipped up. You know, it's, the understanding is it's no big deal, it's just a slip. You know, that's what we say when you make a minor mistake. I slipped up. Don't worry about it. Never happen again. A slip, I said? Momentary loss of focus? The greatest sin in the history of humanity? Why we're all here? Why we're all suffering? Why we experience death? A slip? I didn't believe it. I went to my Arabian friends at that time. I didn't know any Arabic. They came to this verse. We went through it line by line. I said, now don't change any words. Just read them one at a time. But Satan made them. And I said, okay, this one. This one right here. What does it mean? Tell me what that means. They looked at it, it says, uh, slip. <laughs> slip. And expelled them from the state in which they were. A slip, I thought? But then maybe I was trying to force the traditional understanding, the traditional interpretation. Maybe it was just a slip. I mean, after all, they didn't commit murder. They didn't commit robbery, rape, pillaging, assault. They ate, they ate, a, they ate a couple of pieces of fruit. Well, it's not the greatest sin in the history of humanity by any means. And then the next verse says, and then they were expelled from the state in which they were. Well, what state were they? Let's see now. Let's go back from where we started. First, mankind is being taught. We see he's an intellectual being. Then we show he's a moral being. Moral being means he's a being that's going to have to make choices. And then God gives him this choice. It's not a huge deal. It's not the gravest sin in the history of humanity by any means. It's minor by any standards. They make it, though. We see that God originally intended to put man on earth as his vicegerent. We see a period of preparation where he's being prepared intellectually, where he's growing intellectually, where he's growing as a moral creature. When does God finally put him on earth? What signals that he's ready to begin? He makes his first independent choice. It's not the worst deed in the history of humanity. It's minor on anybody's scale, but it shows that mankind is ready to act on his own, to be his own, to make his own choices, that God has empowered him to make choices, and he's ready to make them and carry them out.
and see them most often to their expected ends, if God wills. <clears throat> and that seems to be the only real significance of it. But I thought, maybe I'm getting this wrong. Maybe God just blows off into an angry rampage the next verse. So I look at the next one and it says, and then Adam received words from his Lord. And he turned, then God turned to him mercifully. For he's off returning, ever merciful. Well, if I had any doubts up till now that God is not enraged by what this has happened, that God hasn't prepared mankind for this choice, for what was eventually going to happen, that all this was preparation for mankind to begin his earthly sojourn in this famous allegory. If I had any doubts before now, I had them, certainly didn't have them after reading this verse. This verse is entirely consoling, reaching and merciful, reaching out to mankind in mercy. Mankind goes to earth. He's obviously afraid. He obviously feels remorse. He's in an unfamiliar environment. And what does God do? He turns to him. <coughs> He turns to him. In Arabic, the word is like, has the meaning of like a father turning towards an infant or a child or somebody or a parent, a mother turning towards her child. And he turns to him mercifully, and he for God is off returning, ever merciful. And Adam receives words from his Lord. What kind of words? Probably words of consolation, words of hope, words to tell him not, not to be scared. And in the next verse, we see those are exactly the type of words that Adam receives. He says, go down, Adam and his spouse, go down from the state, all of you together. Repeating that again, just so that we know that this is not a punishment here. Go down from the state, all of you together, and truly there will come to you guidance from me. And whoever follows my guidance has nothing to fear, nor shall they grieve. It is, a, it is an emotional picture. This young couple, young couple, is here you know, in, in fear and in, in shame feeling remorse, and God reaches out to them and turns towards them and tells them, you have nothing to fear, nor shall you grieve. I know this is tough for you, but you've been prepared for it up, to, all, up till now, through your entire existence. It had to happen. This is a necessary stage in your development, in your growth, but just hang in there. Follow my guidance. Be true to me, and I'll be true to you. I'll guide you. I'll help you. I'll do whatever you need. Just follow my guidance, and you have nothing to fear, nor shall you grieve. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> so I was impressed. You know, I thought this author, whom I didn't know, I thought was extremely brilliant because the story is entirely coherent, but it's bringing out entirely new meaning, and it's stressing some things in the human equation that I would never have normally thought of. Actually, I thought these sort of things argued against the existence of God. Here, the author was using them to say, look at these. These play a fundamental role in the purpose of life. What? Intellect. Human beings have intellect. Right. In response to the angel question, they are moral creatures. And they are subjected to evil and angelic promptings. And they have to choose between them again and again and again throughout their existence. And their growth, which the Quran talks about frequently, is going to depend on that. We're here to grow, as we will see. But it emphasizes choice. Human beings are creatures of choice. It also emphasizes suffering. Suffering. Hey, that's pretty nice writing. It also emphasizes suffering. Human beings are going to suffer here on Earth. That's the first thing that the story mentions. Spread corruption and shed blood? Havoc, suffering, pain? Yes, these three things play a central role somehow, the story is saying, in our development on Earth, in our very purpose of our development. These are the three things we've always had the most trouble grappling with, all theologies have. Why give us intellect? If it leads us often to challenge in our minds the existence of God. If we can't reconcile the existence of God with our minds, with our reason. Why give us choice if we can choose to do wrong? Just make us angels. <laughs> why let us suffer so on earth? Just pop us into heaven. And here the Quran is telling that these play essential roles in our, in our attaining of faith. Not only these, of course, it also mentions guidance, God's forgiveness, revelation, etc., angelic forces, satanic temptation. It mentions all these other things as well. But these three essentially really caught my attention. <coughs> I never expected that these three things would be emphasized. 
And so as I read through the Quran, I looked, anytime I saw anything that seemed to relate to this, I would write down notes and underline it. You know, and I would walk up and down in San Francisco with my pen as I'm walking, because I like to walk about seven miles every day, and I'd be underlining. My friends would always say, Jeff, what book are you reading? And I would lie to them, and I'd tell them, oh, it's a great novel or something. You know, I didn't want them to know that I was reading the Quran. I think they thought I was going nuts. As he takes a sip of water, I think that's a good place to stop part one. Uh, but before we end it here, maybe just uh, go over some final thoughts. You know, I've been trying to suspend some of my uh, pre-understandings because I've studied Abrahamic faiths. I've studied Western traditions, many religions and stuff like that. Um, but the thing that kind of like stuck out to me in that was the point where he was talking about man kind of like being brave enough almost to go out and take a step on his a step on it by himself and make his own decision outside of what he thought god saw as what was best for him and i'm just being honest from a place that i come from i personally think that is part of uh our evolutionary process is becoming more braver to accept our own independence and kind of figure out who we are um, rather than uh, relying on a God figure, you know, not that God isn't real, but that dependence, like that, that holding on part of our, our own personal growth in just my opinion is, uh, I don't know, f about becoming stronger in who we are, figuring out who we are, what's going on and taking risks. And, you know, when we fall, we, you know, we admit it and, taking accountability for the good and the bad choices that we that we make mm -hmm. um how about you any points in the in the last section something there? about what you just said made me think that bravery is accepting change yeah braver there's something about that you know and that's that's pulling from something else i heard recently but i i just wanted to say the only thing i planned on saying when we paused it was First, I thought, I'll say, do everything the way he read his scriptures. Breaking it down line by line. Yeah. Considering it seriously as if it is real. There's like a million little things he did. And I felt like saying, as an instruction to the viewer and myself and everyone, do everything the way he read that scripture. But I think instead I'll refine that to... What would happen if you did everything the way he reads scripture? What would happen to your life if you did everything just the way he's demonstrated he studied that scripture? Through meticulous detail? Through reverence? Through yeah. serious questioning? Open-mindedness? Because one person might pick it up, start reading that story, and be going, man, it's a fairy tale. Throw it away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he took it seriously, and he took it apart. And look at all the stuff he discovered from taking it apart. Now, what happens if you do that in everything you do, including other scriptures, mm. including mm. all the scriptures, including what all the people around you are doing? If you did that in everything, you're essentially applying crazy amounts of awareness. That is a good point. Uh, I think we'll end it on that point. That was good. This is it for part one. Uh, make sure to you know, click on the link for part two to continue with this. And don't forget, if you enjoyed this, to hit the like, subscribe, share this with a friend, and everyone, until next time, stay, stay spiritual. spiritual.